the news agents. My election uh, to the post of First Minister demonstrates the change that's happening on this island. And that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing because this change, I think, can benefit us all. And I believe that we can do two things at once. We can have power sharing, we can make it stable, we can work together every day in terms of public services, and whilst we also pursue our equally legitimate um, aspirations. That is the new First Minister of Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill. She is the first, Sinn Féin, the first nationalist First Minister or indeed leader of Northern Ireland in its over 100 year history. She became First Minister on Saturday when Stormont, the Northern Irish government, took its place again. The question, but within 48 hours already, the delicate power sharing arrangements are already being buffeted by that question. Does a Sinn Féin First Minister mean that Irish unification is on the way? Today, we peek behind the curtain and ask what we now know about the compromises that had to be made to get that deal done and what the chances are of it really lasting. Welcome to the News Agents. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And in a moment, we're going to be talking to Chris Steele, the former MI6 officer, who Donald Trump tried to sue over claims that Chris Steele made in a dossier several years ago about what Donald Trump did or didn't do with sex workers in a Moscow hotel room. Chris Steele tells us what security forces here and in the US are thinking right now ahead of a potential second term for Donald Trump. But first, we are going to talk about what happened at the weekend and in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, and what is unfolding there today as well. Rishi Sunak uh, is there talking to leaders and making a series of visits. And you have to step back for a moment and just consider the real symbolism of Michelle O'Neill becoming First Minister. This is in the whole hundred year or so history of Northern Ireland, the first time, as I was saying, that a nationalist, someone who wants to see Irish unification, has led Northern Ireland. You've got to remember that when partition happened back in 1922, that the borders of Northern Ireland, the numbers of counties, the number of counties of Northern Ireland was drawn up specifically to ensure that there would be a permanent unionist Protestant majority in Northern Ireland. The idea of a permanent Protestant majority has gone, but the Unionists took solace with the idea that they would always be on top politically. And although it is true that the positions of First Minister and Deputy First Minister, Deputy First Minister is going to be the DUP's Emma Little Pengelly, an avowed Unionist, of course, despite the fact that those two positions are co equal, that both have to agree at all times for anything to happen, the symbolism is undeniable. And that is why the pictures of a Sinn Féin First Minister leading Northern Ireland have gone around the world. Yeah, I do think there is something about this image. And we have had, obviously, Sinn Féin and the DUP side by side before. That was how the Good Friday Agreement was embodied. And I think it's important to note that both Michelle O'Neill and Emma Little Pengelly essentially came of age in that era. They both worked for, if you like, the godfathers on either side, uh, Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley. So they have grown up in the shadow or in the, the potential, the belief of what Good Friday could produce. And I think seeing those two women, Michelle O'Neill and Emma Little Pengeli, side by side, it feels, I mean, it looks transformational. And I think this is where you have to be slightly careful because we have seen Sinn Féin and the DUP side by side. But these two women are the product of the Good Friday Agreement. They came of age, they came of political age in an era which showed that there could be compromise and union and discussion as opposed to violence. And I think it's particularly important given what we know about the, if you like, the upbringing of each of these women because they both come from paramilitary families. Yeah. You know, Michelle O'Neill, born into... A, a, an IRA family, her, her father, her uncle, were both prisoners. Two of her cousins were shot, one fatally whilst on active duty. You know, she has revered um, her father, Brendan Doris, as a, as a brilliant man. She was basically, I'm going to say, kind of blessed by Martin McGuinness, who was part of that original you know, line-up with Ian Paisley um, as the representative of Sinn Féin when Ian Paisley was First Minister for the DUP. And 
I think Martin McGuinness or maybe Jerry Adams spoke at her father's funeral and she then spoke or helped carry the coffin at Martin McGuinness's funeral. So she's incredibly entwined, right, in not just Sinn Féin, but in the IRA, you know, as as was the sort of larger political family of that. And the same if you look at Emma Little Pengeli, who is also the daughter of a, well, this obviously a loyalist paramilitary. And they've both had these incredibly political upbringings, which I suppose leads you to understand how they've got here. But it's nevertheless quite extraordinary. And there is something about I think the youth of the two women, you know, they're both in their 40s. It's almost incomprehensible that Michelle O'Neill is a grandmother at 47. She had a baby when she was 16. She was a single mother. Then she married at at 18. And I suppose that kind of suggests a, um, a sort of connection, really, to the people of Northern Ireland, that she is somebody that a lot of people can relate to, if not from their political persuasion, from the fact that she seems to be a very ordinary working class woman who somehow, through extraordinary circumstances, has got to the very top of the party and the, and the tree. Yeah, and this is, as, as always with Northern Ireland, I'm reporting on, on Northern Irish politics, you, you have to be so aware of the potential for of the importance of, of symbolism. Um, but also of the tension between that yeah. and of how that actually changes political reality. So on the one hand, M- Michelle O'Neill, the fact that she is a Catholic, the fact that she's a nationalist in a, used to be called a province, a, a state, a political entity that was quite literally geared around systemic discrimination of Catholics is extraordinary and is a testament to the journey that Northern Ireland has been on. On the other hand you can understand that there are unionists who are deeply, deeply disturbed by it because this is a woman and this is a a political party which still says that there was no alternative quotes to the IRA's campaign of struggle. And so all of this continues to live on and the acceptance of each side that the other has very different narratives is central to Northern Irish politics or politics in Northern Ireland. But she did make in in that speech on Saturday again, talking about symbolism, she did certain things which matter and which are designed to try and extend that hand to the unionist community. So, you know, for example, the very fact that she talked about Northern Ireland, a lot of nationalists, and she included, will rarely do that. They will talk about the North because they don't accept the validity of Northern Ireland as a state. They don't accept partition, or at least historically that was the case. So these little things matter. She also used that incredible phrase, didn't she? British or Irish or both or neither. Yes. You know, and that, that sense that sometimes you feel your identity very strongly and sometimes you actually want to be able to accept multiple identities because that is the only way that you can actually survive in a place where you are so defined by where you came from or what you believe that it is sometimes sort of impossible to escape from. Which was always the great genius of the Good Friday Agreement in the first place, which is that it tried to soften the edges of on identity, I, exactly. Yeah. Identity in Northern Ireland was always deeply hard-edged, deeply sharp. Was sharp. You were either a loyalist, or you were a nationalist, or you were British, or you were Irish. The whole point of the Good Friday process was to say those things matter less. That you blurred the divisions and the lines between the two, and indeed you started to see the emergence of a new identity, which is being from Northern Ireland. I'm Northern Sorry, Irish, said- and that is what Brexit basically rode a coach and horses through yeah. because it resurrected literally in the case of the Irish border kind of like are you in or are you out are you in or are you out you are, could no longer be in quite the mm. same way northern irish and british or you had to kind of so decide slipping osmoting between the borders precisely the question of course and you can argue as we were saying last week that this is an attempt to finally put the last piece of the brexit puzzle in place with the restoration of stormont the question of course the two questions that are now basically haunting the whole thing as much as you can get starry-eyed about the symbolism is one will it last and you know we've got to remember that even before brexit stormont since the good friday agreement has not been in session for 40 percent of its existence yeah. either because Sinn fein have walked out or because the dup have walked out and that as i say predated brexit and often was about other things and the other question is whether any of this actually leads to the possibility of a border poll, as outlined in the Good Friday Agreement as being a possibility when the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland thinks there is a majority for it, on Irish unification, i.e. a referendum on Irish unification. And obviously, 
with the prospect of a nationalist first minister in Belfast, and indeed potentially the possibility of a Sinn Féin Taoiseach in Dublin, which is also a possibility. Sinn Féin leader Mary Lou Macdonald has been polling very well now, basically since the last election, did very well in the last Irish general election of 2020, that you could have Sinn Féin first minister in Belfast. And that would, on some level, again, symbolically, kind of change the dynamics, certainly between London and Dublin and Belfast. And some people saying, does that make a border poll more likely? I guess on the one hand, Michelle O'Neill has to say that. She has to speak to her constituency, which is Sinn Féin. We haven't forgotten what the sort of the overarching ambition, if you like, is. But I also think that a decade is a long time and who knows what's going to happen in a decade. And as you say, it has to be done by the will of the people. Literally, you know, it has to come above 50% of the people. Is it 50%? Yeah, yeah. or possibly even higher in yeah. terms of the public. It has to overcome a threshold when the public is asked. I, I think the other point of the jigsaw, actually, is when you talk to people in Ireland, a lot of them are saying, don't make the mistake of thinking we want a United Ireland. We don't. That's a massive drain on Ireland's resources right now because Northern Ireland is much more expensive to run. As be, it's, be a much just, it's a lot poorer now. So this idea that somehow there is a sort of golden dream from everyone who lives in Ireland that they want to see United Ireland is a complete fantasy. Well, but this is again where potentially the prospect of having Mary Lou Macdonald as T-shirt could change something. Because, of course, as part of the Good Friday Agreement itself, both Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael, the main Irish political parties, their Taoiseachs have, like British Prime Ministers, effectively sort of said, that's for Northern Ireland yeah. to sort out. That's that's their will. That was, again, one of the great beauties of the Good Friday process, that basically London and Dublin more or less kind of renounced their territorial interests in Northern Ireland and said, that is for Northern Ireland to deal with. Obviously, if you have Mary Lou Macdonald as Taoiseach, that's different because she very much doesn't believe that. She wants there to be reunification. Whether that translates into anything is, is a different question because we should remember that, again we can get, this is the tension between the symbolism and the kind of real politic. The symbolism is having your first nationalist first minister, important, will mean a great deal to many people, for good or an ill. It's also worth remembering that Sinn Féin basically got more or less the same percentage of the votes in the last Assembly election as they did in the Assembly election before that. The reason that Michelle O'Neill has become first minister is because the DUP support fell away. Yeah. Because, because that's uh, more split. Because it's been split because of Brexit and their role in Brexit. And you've had disgruntled unionists voting for more hardline unionist parties in particular, namely the TUV, okay. which has been arguing most vociferously both against the DUP and against the Irish sea border. So the actual balance between nationalism and unionism in Northern Ireland hasn't actually changed that much. It's roughly equal. Unionism still just about, if you put all the unionist parties together, it's just about on top. It's just in terms of which party has come first and second in the actual poll back in 2022 that has translated into the First Minister, Deputy First Minister arrangement that we've seen. Well, we're going to talk now to Sam McBride. He's Northern Ireland's editor for the Belfast Telegraph. And I guess we want to understand if there is now a moment of optimism. Sam, it was a historic day on Saturday. The pictures went around the world. Can you give us a sense of what comes next and what the feeling is in Stormont at the moment about the viability of the new government. I think there is something of a, of a paradox here because we've had these big days any number of times in Northern Ireland. Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, Peter Robinson and Martin McGuinness, Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill. Stormont has been up, it's been down, up and down like a yo-yo. And every time it comes back, there's this sense of great optimism. This time it's going to be better. This time it's going to be different. This time they're going to focus on bread and butter issues. They're not going to get into tribal stuff. We had all of that on Saturday. There was a lot of optimism around Stormont, a real sense of something had changed. There was suddenly some form of government coming back after two years. And yet I think one of Northern Ireland's problems is ironically that it almost has too much consensus sometimes. Often our politics is seen from outside and even here um, as being far too divided, far too bitter, far too um, deeply split between the two communities. And that is true, but also sometimes that's all cast aside and there's this air of optimism which carries all before it. And then a year later, I think a lot of people in Northern Ireland and outside Northern Ireland wonder, what on earth went wrong? You were telling us this was great. Everyone was was very positive. This was a great deal. Things were different this time. And I think when you scratch the surface of what happened on Saturday, you see elements that are pretty concerning. So there was meant to be a deal, we we're told by Sinn Féin, with now the second biggest party, the DUP. And that deal was meant to say that as they picked their ministries, 
on Saturday in the Stormont Chamber. It had all been worked out in advance and that basically there was a fast one pulled by the DUP at the last minute. They were meant to pick one ministry, they picked another. We've got the DUP saying that was never the case. That's that's not right at all. So from the outset, the two parties at the top of Stormont are not maybe at each other's throats, but there's there's no real trust there between them. And when you look beneath there, it's, it's equally problematic. So you've got the Ulster Unionist Party, which are in the executive. Their party leader, Doug Beattie, has come out this morning, said he wanted to be in opposition. So, I mean, I, I can't think of any political leader anywhere in the world who has said that they don't want to be in government, but they find themselves in government because other people in their party want to be in government. We've got the main party of opposition, the SDLP, the main nationalist party at one point in Northern Ireland, now the smaller nationalist party. And um, they have just suspended one of their few MLAs that, that, that are left on their benches because he left early on Saturday because he is double jobbing as the manager of a Gaelic football team and he had to catch a helicopter to the other side of Ireland. I mean, there are real problems going on here beneath the surface. Um, but publicly, in terms of what people see on the news tonight, it's the Prime Minister, it's a Taoiseach, everything looks great, everybody's happy, everybody's smiling. I'm not sure it's quite as straightforward behind the scenes. It's extraordinary to get that insight from you, Sam. If I asked you to go back even two days before that, for the moment when the deal seemed to come together. I mean, we described it on the news agents as a sort of, you know, a happy fudge. It'd be much better to get your insights as to where the concessions, as you see them, were actually made and whether those concessions can withhold the kind of force of, of the future now. So there, there were concessions made on both sides. That is very clear. I think it's easier for the European Union, it's easier for the British government, for them to have made concessions here because they were never quite as dogmatic about this. They were pretty dogmatic, certainly from, from Brussels perspective, they were saying, this is the best we can do, et cetera, et cetera. But from the DUP's perspective, they presented their seven tests um, for, for judging any deal in almost religious terms. I mean, they were written on tablets of stone. They were things that they could not alter, they would not alter. They got a very robust mandate for that from their voters. Um, the, the polls, which we had in the Belfast Telegraph, showed that their support was going up as they became more and more hardline on that after the election. So for them to suddenly say, actually, you know what? It's more important we get government back is a really remarkable turnaround. The big vulnerability here for Jeffrey Donaldson is that he is saying he's got rid of the Irish Sea border to all intents and purposes for any goods that are staying in Northern Ireland. And that's simply not true. Uh, there are goods that will stay in Northern Ireland that will travel through this red lane. They will have to go through bureaucracy and um, there will be some checks on them. But actually, checks are not the most significant element. It's what comes before the checks. It's the paperwork, which is the which is the main impediment to trade here. And the great hope for him is that that is so far out of sight that most people don't see it, that it doesn't really matter. The risk for him is that if something goes wrong, if there is a, a horse meat scandal, if there is a food problem, if there's something which is being smuggled into the EU through Northern Ireland that causes the EU to use its full legal powers to insist on more checks, that is going to be difficult. And so I think this can work if there is goodwill on both sides, if lots of blind eyes are turned in various directions. But if there is a rigorous implementation of what's on the page, it's not going to meet what the government or Jeffrey Donaldson have told the public it's going to be. What is your assessment of where we are in terms of the Good Friday Agreement and the future of the union? I mean, on the one hand, we've got Michelle O'Neill, first nationalist leader of Northern Ireland in its history. One of the first things she said is the has referred to the possibility of, of a border poll in the next 10 years. On the other hand, unionism and the DUP have gone back into Stormont partly to shore up the union because they think that the whole process will fall apart if the if there is no continued government at Stormont. There's been a lot of fevered talk about what this might mean in terms of having a nationalist leader. Where do you think the union is at now? So it's very easy to misunderstand this from inside Northern Ireland, but especially from outside Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin is the biggest party. Um, that is historic. That is remarkable. 
nobody with any sense of history can play that down. It is really, really significant, but it's significant for now in a purely symbolic sense. Um, these two roles, the first, the deputy first minister, are entirely equal. One cannot change the logo of their department without getting the other sign off. They are absolutely hamstrung by each other. That's the way it's always been since Stormont um, was set up after the Good Friday Agreement. It is the way it is now. So this is not like British politics where you have got two big parties. Yes, there's some smaller parties there, but two big parties. And if Labour are up, it means the Tories are down. There's a huge landslide from one to the other. That's not what happens in our politics. We have a plethora of parties, tiny little parties. So even Sinn Féin as the biggest party has something like 30% of the vote. They're nowhere near getting over 50% um, as a party. They're nowhere near getting over 50% for Irish unity. Very few people who support Irish unity actually believe that if a border poll was held tomorrow, they would win but they do hope that they could win, maybe in five years' time, maybe in 10 years' time. That's the, that's the big strategic move here by them. And also, if Sinn Féin can get into government in the south of Ireland, in the Irish Republic, there is the potential here that you could have a, a Sinn Féin Taoiseach in Dublin, Sinn Féin First Minister in Northern Ireland, enormously significant in terms of the symbolism of that. And you could have some real world effects beyond symbolism. You could, for instance, have, as you now have, a Sinn, Féin, um, a Sinn Féin minister for the economy in Northern Ireland, a Sinn Féin minister for the economy in the south of Ireland. They could work to harmonise things across the border, build an all-island economy in a way that last week's deal said the British government now no longer believes in that. Those are words on a page from a government which will not be there much longer in London. What could be far more significant is what actually happens in terms of who has the levers of power in Belfast and in Dublin. But it's very important, I think, that people realise Sinn Féin being in power in Belfast as, as nominally the, the, uh, the top dog in Stormont Castle, hugely significant in terms of the history of Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was built so that that would not happen, could not happen. It has happened. That really matters, but it does not mean Irish unity is around the corner. Sam, I... I just want to ask you a little bit about the characters, the personalities of the two people in the centre of this now. I mean, as you said at the beginning, it's not that we haven't seen the arrangement before. It's not that we haven't seen two women there before. But when you get Michelle O'Neill and Emma Little Pengelly in that photo, maybe it's their youth or maybe it's the fact that they both come from such deeply political families or maybe it's that they were born of the generation of the good friday agreement and both worked for if you like you know the elder statesmen of of, of uh, ian paisley and martin mcginnis there is something just so i'm going to say it feels transformational seeing them there is that something y you'll tell me as a, as a sort of journalist on the spot to get over or is that something that you think northern ireland shares at the moment well, I think that as journalists, we should be sceptical about these things, but we shouldn't be cynical about them. Things can change, but we should question whether they're likely to change. These are two people who have been at the heart of the Stormont system for many years. Emma Little Pengelly from 2007, basically, was in the Stormont system either as a special advisor um, or as, as someone who was an MLA, as a junior minister in Stormont Castle. Michelle O'Neill has been an MLA, has been a senior minister, has been deputy first minister. So been there when Stormont has been thoroughly dysfunctional and we shouldn't forget that just because they're at the top now and um, they are more to the forefront there but they are not um, new people as such they have been very deeply involved there's also a big question here I think about their level of authority within their parties and um, both Michelle O'Neill and um, Emma Little Pengelly are not the leaders of their parties. Yeah. They are potentially going to have to go away all the time and consult the leadership, consult other people about decisions. Stormont has not been known for its alacrity in making decisions. It's a it's a place where things get vetoed, where, where, where the system gets gummed up very, very quickly. Stuff doesn't move very much. And um, that could make it even worse. Um, there has for a long time been a system where Sinn Féin didn't have their leader in Stormont, but now we don't even have the DUP leader in Stormont. That could potentially be a banana skin here. It's really great to have your insights, Sam. It's, it, yeah, it's a real treat for us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. So as we said at the beginning, Rishi Sunak has been in Belfast today and in Northern Ireland today. And as we were saying last week, something of a victory lap for him. He doesn't get that many good days um, as Prime Minister in the situation that he's in, and he can point to this as being something that he has invested a lot of political capital in and 
not just down to him, but I think it's not unfair to say he's had a role in bringing it about. This is what he said in Belfast today on the question of whether all of this might mean a border poll our, on Irish unity. Well, I had very constructive meetings this morning with the executive, political leaders across Stormont, and it's a historic and important day for the country because Northern Ireland's politicians are back in charge making decisions on behalf of their people, which is exactly how it should be. Now, our new deal gives them more funding and more powers than they've ever had so that they can deliver for families and businesses across Northern Ireland. And that's what everyone's priority is now. Mm. It's not constitutional change. It's delivering on the day-to-day -day things that matter to people. That's why I'm here visiting this school at Grand Craig Integrated Primary School, because the children here are the future. And because of the progress that we've made in the last few days, that future is undeniably brighter. I think it is a reminder, actually, of how successful Sunak has been at negotiations like this. The Windsor Framework a year ago and the sort of culmination of it with the return to power sharing now you can only start to think if he hadn't spent so much time, so much political capital fighting, you know, the small boats or the Rwanda planes or whatever, what might have been achieved in terms of just easing relations with the partners that we really need to be doing things with, whether it's within the United Kingdom or further afield. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I suppose he would say that um, no matter how successful he is in Northern Ireland, there are very few votes in it for him. Yeah. Um, it's something that he's tried to clear up the mess of around some of his predecessors, in particular Boris Johnson. And so he's had to focus the politics elsewhere. I mean, I think in terms of what happens now and when all of the kind of journalists and the politicians have gone home and Stormont is left having to govern in the very unusual arrangement that it has, as Sam was saying there, you know, Basically, the two major parties have to agree on everything. And you get it's, a three billion pound, you know, starter. You've got three billion pound starter, but the three billion pounds that Rishi Sunak has basically given as something of a bung and incentive to get the DUP to go back into government. They're saying that's still not enough. That mm. Northern Ireland still needs more money to avert future strikes and so on. And and it is true to say, and this is, I think, what will determine the viability and how long this new administration lasts for, or certainly how successful or popular it is. You know, the domestic situation in Northern Ireland is dire in all sorts of public services I mean, it's true in great britain as, as yeah, well you don't have to look that far no no well. that's true but you know you, if you look i mean the the health service in northern ireland for example bad everywhere else but in the time that stormont has been on ice waiting lists in northern ireland have gone up 15 percent look at what's happened to loch Nee. loch Nee is the sort of main big freshwater lake in the middle of northern ireland from which 40 percent of northern ireland's drinking water comes um, big, big scandal in Northern Ireland hasn't been picked up that much in Britain, but it's become chronically polluted with a form of bacteria which has turned large swathes of it into a foul smelling green soup. I mean, there couldn't be a better metaphor for the stasis and pollution of the Northern Ireland political system than that. There are so many massive domestic problems and that is doubtless what the unionists and certainly the British government are going to try and focus Sinn Féin on. But of course, as always with Northern Ireland, the constitutional question will loom long. We'll be back in a moment with Chris Steele and his lawsuit against Donald Trump. This is the greatest witch hunt. It started with Russia, Russia, Russia. Remember that? He was with four hookers. You think that was good that night to go up and tell my wife, it's not true, darling. I love you very much. It's not true. Actually, that one she didn't believe because she said he's a germaphobe. He's not into that, you know? That was Donald Trump on the campaign train in Iowa, referencing an extraordinary story that emerged in 2017 when it turned out that a former MI6 officer, Chris Steele, with his intelligence agency, had described what he was told in a dossier that Trump had been compromised by Russian security, who had leaked that Trump had once employed sex workers to urinate on a bed in a Moscow hotel room that had once been slept in by Barack and Michelle Obama. This was part of what came to be called the Steele dossier, or in more fruity terms, Peepee Gate. And this was the case that Donald Trump tried to bring to court to sue Chris Steele over. On Thursday, that case was thrown out. So Chris Steele has unwittingly unknowingly in a way ended up as one of the kind of central players of the PR war around the Trump presidency and this is the latest part of the saga between the two men Trump and Steele and Chris is here and you can 
finish the story for us, Chris, because he didn't win. He lost that just now. Yeah, and I think it's important to stress that actually this is the second case that Donald Trump has brought against us. He brought one against us in Florida, which he lost in the late uh, autumn of, ni- uh, of 2022. And it was only really when that case failed and collapsed that he decided to try and sue us in London. So it was sort of uh, illegal tourism, really, coming over here. I mean, just remind us, what was at the heart of this? It's a very complicated case because it relies to um, not libel law, which is the usual issue that we're up against, but a data protection law, much of which actually hasn't been tested in case law in court. So it's quite an important judgment in that regard. Um, And essentially what he was arguing was that... um, that material in the dossier was um, had caused him distress, was untrue, and he wanted it rectified. But of course, he brought this case six years after the dossier came out, and the judge picked up on that big time in her judgment by saying that if he'd been so concerned about his reputation, he would have sued us a lot earlier. He then tried to counter that by saying it was because I was president at the time, and our lawyers pointed out that he was still suing people in civil courts at that point. So clearly his motivation really was to maintain pressure on us and to get me, essentially, I I would put it. The judge concluded that his lawyers had actually misfiled the case. I mean, unbelievably, they filed the case under the wrong law. Data protection law changed in 2018. And they tried to sue us under data protection law of 2018, when in fact, the relevant law was 1998, which was the previous law. What is it like being put in this position, being sued by Trump. I mean, it, he's at the centre of considerable legal action, as we know, in his own country himself. He took the time, despite all of that, to come after you anyway. Mm. Just talk about a little bit about what that is like. I think he's a, a deeply vengeful man. I mean, I think, you know, you'd imagine that someone who was running for president in the current situation the world's in with all the various crises going on, that he would be focused on that and he'd be focused on his campaign. But of course, he does seem to spend a lot of his time in in courtrooms, admittedly, some of them as defendant. But in this case, a a, a suit of choice, Mm. which was started, you know, less than a a year ago and uh, and which, you know, was never really going to get anywhere, I don't think. I mean, we were advised strongly at the beginning that we had a very high chance of winning this case. And once his lawyers started misfiling and all the rest of it, that we would get a strikeout motion. I mean, I think the the real issue here is why this was allowed to carry on as long as it did. The fact that it cost us £600,000 to get to this point, which incidentally we weren't insured for. Do you get that Um, back? Well, exactly. We get some of it back. We get perhaps up to 75% of it back. But ultimately, you know, for a business like ours, the fact that we're probably going to have to pay out a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand pounds for the pleasure of being sued by Donald Trump and him losing is a real problem I think in our legal system and needs to be looked at very carefully now going forward as part of this whole debate as you know on lawfare. Did you hear from him directly? Did you ever see him? I mean presumably he doesn't come to court in something like this. He didn't turn up at the uh, the strikeout hearing no. I mean he was claiming he would turn up at a trial but a trial would have cost us probably between one and two million just to fight it. And of course, there is a question mark, I think, and I hope it, I'm wrong about this, as, as to whether we will actually re- retrieve these costs at all. You don't think he'll pay? Is I, it him I, that would have to pay? Yes, or? it's him that would have to pay, or, or at least some of the super PACs that are funding him, which again is another issue, that he seems to have been spending political donations on pursuing vindictive legal action in foreign jurisdictions. But I think, um, given the debt he's in and given the possible judgment coming in this New York case, which you're fully aware of, um, he might run out of money before he gets to pay us our dues. And presumably it takes extra court time, effort on your part, litigation, just to go through that process. It doesn't happen automatically. Yes, uh, we don't know quite yet how he's going to react to the co- a cost order that will come. He's already looking at 83 million. I think yours is a small change. It is, but nevertheless, he might he might well not want to pay it for yeah. all sorts of reasons, including psychological, political ones. The idea that he's paying Chris Steele and Orbis a large sum of money for having failed in a court case against us is pretty humiliating. For well, him. it makes it seem almost as if he's affirming the what was in the dossier on some level. Well, that's he, he, what... no, presumably he would to take Donald Trump's side for a moment. He presumably say it was inaccurate. 
uh, I stand by that, and the judge just threw it out because it was wrongly petitioned by my lawyers. Right? I mean, he could he could still or claim say it's that, a British court, or yeah, he, he could claim that he never lost well, anything. It would be rigged. But interestingly, you know, the, the lies coming from Trump and his camp continue unabated. Uh, and one of them was that uh, his spokesman issued a statement last week saying the court had found that we'd pr- produced no evidence in support of the contents of, of the dossier. The court never even examined that because they didn't need to get to that point. The judge made it explicit in her judgment that she was ruling the ca- case out of court on a strikeout because of all sorts of other reasons and that she didn't need to get to the point where she was commenting or otherwise on the veracity of the dossier. So so this stuff that we face from Trump and his, his spokesman is a tissue of lies. And I, I copied you over a, a clip of something he said in 2020 about how we'd been paid millions and millions of dollars to produce this document. When it's been well established in litigation under oath that we were only paid $168,000 for four months' work, which in our business is not exceptional. We obviously can't ask you who your source is, um, but we can try and get an understanding of what you think was behind the idea of a source leaking to you, a former MI6 officer, because we've had a Russia investigation here many times from Donald Trump's sort of team MAGA that there was no collusion and no obstruction found. But what part do you think, or do we now know, Russia did or didn't play in 2016? That's a huge question to answer. I mean, obviously, quite a lot of it was covered in the in the Mueller investigation. When you look at the situation... The Mueller investigation was Robert Mueller, who is the former FBI, FBI yeah. director. He's yeah. the former FBI director at the behest yeah. of... Of, I think it was actually technically Rod Rosenstein, who, as Deputy Attorney General, set up that particular investigation. But also the congressional investigation that came from the Senate Intelligence Committee afterwards and others, <clears throat> that actually Russia played a very profound uh, role in, in trying to influence the 2016 election. And I would argue that um, this year in particular, given the situation in Ukraine and Putin's precarious position there, that interference in the American election this year has become an existentialist challenge for Putin. Putin's one hope, I think, of defeating Ukraine now is that Trump and his isolationists in Congress and in the presidential election managed to cut off the aid flow to Ukraine. And do you think that Putin is now playing a part in the re-election of Donald Trump? Well, he certainly would be aiming to do that. I mean, it's slightly early days yet in, in the sense that it's February and this will pres- activity will presumably pick up over the summer, depending on how Trump does in the primaries and everything else. But I would say that when you look at some very odd things that are going on at the moment where half a dozen congressmen, Republican ones, seem entirely determined to cut off Ukraine from aid, when you see Tucker Carlson, who's a sort of shill for, for Trump, visiting Moscow and re- reputedly now about to interview Putin for American television, I mean, what's that about? And you see people like Viktor Orban in Hungary and his posturing and so on, uh, trying to keep Finland and Sweden out of NATO. Um, It doesn't take a great genius. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out that the motivation behind all this does seem to be coming from Moscow and from Putin. The difference, I suppose, this time will be that the Biden administration, arguably unlike the Obama administration, will be more alive to it. Obviously, have even greater skin in the game because he's literally running for re-election. How well or otherwise do you think they might be able to combat any attempts by Putin to interfere in the election on Trump's behalf? It's a very interesting question, which we think about a lot, is to the extent to which Trump, when when in office and Republicans in Congress even now, have cowed the security authorities in America from properly investigating this sort of issue. Because clearly if Trump gets back in in November and he starts digging out the files of whatever the FBI and CIA and others have been doing this year to try and combat this, um, people's careers and people's livelihood will be put at stake. If you look at what happened after 2016, the people like, obviously, Andrew McCabe and and Bruce Orr, James Comey and all these (coughs) other people. As I said at the beginning, Trump is a very vengeful man, and he will go after these people if he's elected. And I think that's had a chilling effect that's my impression, on the US intelligence and security services into the extent to which they're prepared to look into these things and to act on them. 
So what you're saying is is that there could well be, or the American security services, intelligence services may well be aware of potential attempts by Putin directly, indirectly, the Russian state, to interfere in the election, but they may be cowed or reluctant to investigate them properly because they're afraid of what Trump might do to them in the event that he's re-elected. Precisely. Do you really believe that? You yes. really believe that these you know, men and women of America's security service who serve the Constitution, the American people, wouldn't flag up if they thought that Putin was trying to affect the outcome of an election? I think there's a risk of that, and I think there's some evidence that that might already be happening. I think if you dig down into the open source material, there was a whistleblower, for, I think from the FBI, some months ago that came forward and said that they had been you know, assigned to investigate Giuliani and his links to the Russians through Ukraine, and that they had been dissuaded from doing so by their senior management along the lines of this won't do your career any good, this will be dangerous for us and, and going forward potentially. So I, I think there are some early signs that this is happening and it needs to be called out because of course fundamentally I'm sure most of them believe that in their duty and their oath of office. But I can tell you that if you come under this sort of pressure from Donald Trump and the Republicans that people like Bruce Orr, Andrew McCabe and others have come under, then it's a really, it's a vicious, it's a vicious um, existence of physical as well as psychological pressure. There could be something else going on here, which is not that they're worried about their livelihoods or their jobs, but actually that they have been described by Trump, by the Magalot, as being politicised. Mm. And they are constantly told now that the civil service is working for Biden, that the Department of Justice is working for Biden, that they are not neutral civil servants, but they are political operatives working for Democrats. Yeah. I mean, do you think that's having an effect? Of course it is, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, the whole idea that the FBI is some kind of politicised, left, Biden-leaning organisation, for anyone that's worked with the FBI over many years like I have, it is fundamentally a, quite a conservative organisation. Quite a, Most people in the FBI I've met would, would, would have been traditional Republicans. So I think that this kind of big lie about the FBI and about the intelligence services that's spread by, by Trump and his supporters is doing really little damage to the security fabric of the US and of the West more generally, I would argue. What do you think, I mean, having worked for MI6 and the British security services, what do you think that they will be making? <laughs> Make it sound like you did. Oh, yeah, I did. Or maybe yeah. he did. Oh, maybe. God, yes. I guess. Maybe. It, the cat out the, bag, the revelation. This is what. This is a, you know what? This is why I, I left the security services. Peek behind the curtain. I was his thing. case officer. This is this is why I left the services because I just kept telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you having work, Chris, for uh, MI6. What do you think they will be making of not only potentially the phenomenon that you just described, but also of a Trump restoration? I think they'll be very concerned. Obviously, they're not going to say anything in the public about this. They wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't running a sort of scenario which is how they would handle things were Trump to be re-elected. I mean, you look at the degree to which Trump has been prepared to declassify and circulate irresponsibly and sensitive intelligence. There have been numerous examples of this. The stuff down at Mar-a-Lago. I mean, my, my firm understands... The archives that were removed from the White House. My firm understanding left. is that the, the elements of the Russia investigation disappeared, uh, including documents about us which is and our sources. Uh, but more seriously than that, that actually British secrets were in fact among the documents that were down at um, at Mar-a-Lago, and it's not at all clear who saw them or where they've ended up. I mean, if you're in the security services now, uh, would you be disinclined to be sharing stuff with America? I think you would have to be very careful because... Um, I think the, the classic example, as you know, was the sharing of what is said to have been Israeli intelligence on ISIS um, by Trump in the Oval Office with Lavrov um, back in 2017, which allegedly led to the death of a, a, an agent inside ISIS. And I think when you're looking at things like that, you have to reckon that sharing intelligence, particularly sharing source information with the Americans, were Trump to come to power or back to power, would be a very precarious thing to be doing. And, you know, for all intelligence professionals, their, their primary responsibility is to the safety and security of their sources. 
Uh, and that has to be paramount in this. You can't have a relationship with America if you don't trust the president not to... Well, what, one of the things that we were never told, and even as an intelligence professional weren't actually aware of, is that the US president has the right to declassify any document, and I mean any document, in the US government system. Uh, and that is, with someone like Trump around, of course it had never been tested before, but with someone like Trump around, that's terrifying. Trump, for example, was out talking to some Australian businessman reportedly about the most secret aspects of the US nuclear submarine modus operandi and program. I mean, it's terrifying, frankly. I mean, there are no greater secrets, actually, than those. And what do you deduce from that? What you deduce from it is that he can't be trusted with secret intelligence. Chris Steele, thank you very much for coming in. Tomorrow, we are going to tell you to get out the popcorn. A treat. I'm not sure we've made that joke enough times, or indeed anyone else has. It's popcorn. You know that already. Popular conservatism. Liz Truss is back, and there's a big meeting, and we're all going to go. Get out the pork, surely. Pork scratchings. Or indeed, the pears. Lettuce. The yes. lettuce. Or the lettuce. There's so, there so much food stuff around so for much. us. Yeah. God bless her. See you tomorrow. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 